One of the additions that I've made that's given me the most particular pleasure is that of the two episodes from Lenau's Faust. Now, everybody knows the second one. If you know the piano duet version or the orchestral version, you might even know the first one. But the two of them as piano solos have never been printed together until this edition. And there's a problem which is easily resolved uh, to explain why this came to pass. Liszt made the first Mephisto waltz probably as early as 1857 as a piano piece and was still working on it right up to publication a couple of years later. And then he uh, wrote another work to precede it called The Procession by Night, Der Neschliche Zug. And he expected both of these pieces to be played by an orchestra by then. And he, he himself, as far as I can work out, never played the first Mephisto waltz on the piano. But um, the two orchestral pieces belong together and they are both preceded by long excerpts from Nikolaus Lenau's poem, uh, Faust. And they make such an excellent pairing. It seemed uh, such a strange thing that this never made a solo piano version of the first one that one of his students, a man called Robert Freund, uh, who uh, was really a great proselytizer for Liszt music, and for those who collect rare piano records, he was also the brother of Etelka Freund, who made marvelous recordings. He came to Liszt with a manuscript which he said, Maestro, I have used your two piano, or sorry, your piano duet version and your orchestral version of this piece to do what I think you should have done in the first place, and I've produced a version for piano. Liszt said, that's marvelous, I'll have it published. Um, then, absolutely typical with, uh, with Liszt, he took Freud's manuscript home and rewrote it from top to bottom. And, um, but nonetheless, when it was published, it came out with Liszt's gracious uh, allowance that it had been arranged by Robert Freund. And this has led a whole lot of Liszt scholars to dismiss it immediately as something that was merely a transcription of Liszt by somebody else. But uh, five seconds with the manuscript will assure you that Liszt's input is mighty and considerable. And since, in any case, it had been arranged in the first place from something that Liszt had already done as a piano piece, um, even if for four hands, I think we have to go along with it. And it's an absolutely marvellous piece. It's one of those things that by, by Liszt where he's daring to write harmonies that no one else would do and progressions that no one else would dream of writing. And it's so different in temperament from the first Mephisto waltz that it really is an ideal piece to play before it. And it's a great study on the piano in, in uh, finding different orchestral sounding uh, piano textures. You will have noticed probably, if you've played any list at all, that Liszt brings to mind in his piano music very often orchestral textures and even particular instruments. And sometimes he actually writes something like quasi trombo or quasi violoncello uh, to indicate that this is the sound he's looking for you to imitate. This is in complete contradistinction to the music of Chopin, which always sounds completely as if it was conceived for the piano and with best respects to people who've orchestrated it, really belongs right there on the piano. Uh, <coughs> Liszt's, Liszt's sound world, I think, is really quite different. So you can always imagine at the beginning of this piece that we're dealing with cellos and basses, for example, and then horns. This is even if you had never seen the score. And so on. Among the 
most attractive things that List manages in this piece, this extraordinary series of harmonies. This is such a lovely thing. Everybody should have a go at this to put with the first Mephisto waltz so that you can introduce people to a wider range of what List's able to do. And similarly, in this piece, Liszt introduces a plain song uh, for his choir to sing after, after you've heard them processing through the woods. Uh, it's Pange Lingua Gloriosi, which he also used in one of the symphonic poems. And that allows him a very nice contrast and almost a friendly atmosphere and lovely sounds like And this builds to a mighty climax and then it uh, disappears in something which is harmonically completely magical. That's just pushing the piano to its absolute limits, but also giving you one of the great harmonic shocks. And so I, I recommend everybody has a look at this piece. Then the other piece is, of course, the first Mephisto waltz, which everybody knows and which everybody plays, but 
very few people then have a proper look at the score to see what List actually wrote in it. He calls, he marks it Allegro Vivace. He's got quasi presto in brackets after that, but that, for my money, means not too fast. <clears throat> His pedal directions are very long, and I think we have to flutter our pedal a bit on a modern piano in order not to overwhelm people with the build-up of sound. But <clears throat> it's sort of been, become the way of people playing this at the beginning. Completely secco, and that's not really what Liszt asks for. He actually writes a pedal that goes for about 12 bars. And it's worth working out a way um, whereby you can do exactly what he asks for. But not too fast because the people who are going to hear this tune for the first time it has to be clear and clean then we have some accents that are present in almost none of the performances that one ever hears which are these but they come every single time Liszt uses that phrase, so they're worth putting in. Um, the long glissando, uh, a couple of editions suggest that you should take three bars to play it, but I think if you uh, look very carefully at how Liszt has barred the piece, it's pretty clear that he wants a three-bar rest, and then the glissando has to be done in the space of one bar. So, so long as we are not playing too fast, um, it should work. <laughs> tempo will give you one, two, three, and that is I think what we should try and do. The middle section of this piece is very carefully marked by list un poco meno mosso and then in brackets ma poco, in other words only slightly slower than the first section and of course um, the tradition, which doesn't come from Liszt, uh, is to play it much slower. One often hears... Uh, by which stage all recollection of the waltz has disappeared. So... It's probably closer to the tempo he was looking for. The... Passages which are marked osir. Every time that happens, uh, they are printed on an extra staff. Some editions swap that round with the main text. It is customary uh, to play the harder text, and this applies to pretty well all of list. If he writes an osir and it's more difficult, you can be sure that this is what he played either in private or in public himself. The middle section of this piece also exists in another manuscript which may have been intended to be added to this work or it may have been intended to be a way of providing a separate album leaf. Uh, there's no absolute firm way of deciding which. Uh, my edition prints all of the available extra material which starts just before the middle section. So instead of going... And then at the end of that section, instead of playing which we would then be expecting, and by the way this should be played in tempo so that his four bars rest makes some sense, which is one, two, three, 
One, two, three, four. But in this version where there's all these extra bars, it's... And it's essentially what's going to follow in the version we all know and love, but in a rather a simplified way. And it actually comes to an end in D flat. Which, if we're right in thinking it, this belongs in this piece. That follows on there. At the end of this, I've added some counting numbers just because Liszt put them in at the beginning in the orchestral version. But very often one hears the end of this presto played with the emphasis on the wrong syllable, as it were. But if you play one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, because this writes a two-bar phrase of rests there, so it's one, two, three, four, and one. And similarly, the next time where you have Of course, this only writes poco writ there, but he is very often given a ritonuto which stops anyone from comprehending the meter, it's so slow. There's one famous wrong note in many editions, or there's, there are two actually. The first one is. Um, this. For some unknown reason, uh, even the new list edition, I think, prints E flats there. It can't possibly be right. It's E natural in all the sources, and E natural is exactly what it should be in that harmony. So, so which is perfectly natural progression. The chord, which is frequently uh, played erroneously and published erroneously, is this one. one very often sees with a D sharp and the D sharp can't have any possible relevance to the harmony or to the progression because it's so it's our old friend the German augmented sixth and that's all there is to it so um, the, the next textual problem is uh, the manuscript's very messy about this, but it's got to do with the octave signs at the end of this passage, uh, where many editions put an octave sign for eight bars, where it's quite clear from at least one point in this manuscript where it says loco, that the second bar of the pair is an octave lower. That's to say bar 70, 798, which is this one, just before. So, what it really should be is every every time like that, one up, one up, one down. And so on. Otherwise, fairly straightforward. The coda, where he just says written to el tempo, Remember, your tempo is pressed, though, when you get to written the third tempo, so it cannot be a dodger. Um, and what should give you the clue is this rhythm, which is the only back reference to a waltz. And so if you take the tempo of... have instead
At this point, if you know the orchestral version, you will know that there is a harp cadenza. Uh, in recent years, a manuscript turned up uh, at Sotheby's in London of a Wii cadenza which goes which is almost certainly intended for this piece and so it is printed in this edition. So it's not compulsory but if you do it then it, it makes a very similar uh, feeling to the orchestral one. So you end up with that. Uh, then one on the empty beat, one. Now there's another problem on the last page of this piece because Liszt didn't actually make it completely specific, but if you compare it with <coughs> the other versions, it's got to be that, that when the two four bars come, a two, far, two four bar is equal to a three eight bar that preceded it. So we have, um, gives you two six bar phrases and um, or three four bar phrases you can count it whichever way you like but it, it's the only way to make it add up correctly and it's obviously intended to add up correctly because the whole piece is more or less in four bar phrases. Uh, here as elsewhere when Liszt goes to the trouble of printing a great long poem or section of a play or whatever else uh, at the beginning of the work uh, it's a very good thing to give it a read before you play the music. And um, so some editions of this piece, of course, just leave it out. And then people don't know even that the proper title of the work is A Dance in the Village Inn, and the subtitle is Mephisto Waltz. So um, it's also worth getting hold of Linnau's poem and reading it complete. It's very long. Uh, unfortunately, there's no edition of it currently available in English. You can read it online in German, that's for sure. Uh, the two sections that Liszt used to write these pieces are translated excellently by Michael Short in my edition. So you can have, so long as you've got either French, uh, English or German at your disposal, you can read them, and it's very helpful. Also very helpful in the first piece because. Uh, List arranged the whole poem to be printed at the beginning of the work, but also during the course of the work prints various verses at appropriate places. And so that's always a clue for interpretation. That, I hope, gives you enough enthusiasm to have a look at the pair of pieces as they belong together. Thank you.